Hello, hello, everyone. My name is John Edwards. With me, as always, is Zeke Baker. And together, we make the Dad Shrinking Bourbon. Wherever you are, whatever time it is, thank you for making us a part of your day. And Zeke, thank you for making me a part of your day today. I tell you what, it was tough. It's been tough. I mean, (laughs) you with your new baby, uh, I just got back from vacation. Sorry, we're getting this one to y'all a couple days late. We apologize for that. But, you know, life has been tough for the dads to to get together, you know? Yeah, and then even when our schedules have worked out, um, the the stars haven't quite aligned. We got together last week before... Uh, both of us were checking out for you know Thanksgiving with the families, sat down, did some tastings, uh, had our notes down, literally getting everything set up to record. Hey, the door swings open. Here comes some uh, Diageo, Diego folks. Well, no, I mean, we should set this up first because we tried knowing that we can't record at my house and we can't record at your house. Well, we can. It's just in the garage and cold right now. Yeah, it's in the garage and it was 20 degrees outside. <laughs> we said, you know, Zeke's Airbnb was booked up. We go, all right, let, let's go over to the Whiskey House. We're like 0 for 4 recording at the Whiskey House. So we're sitting there on the couch. We're, we're taking sips of everything. And all of a sudden, door swings open. Continue your story. They, the Diageo reps come in. Our friend Brian Downing comes in. JB comes in. JB had Mary Beth with him, her boys, and then um, happened to have somehow... a 1940s Johnny Walker. With yeah, him. along with another bottle of Heaven Hill 27 he picked up, which I'm sure we'll discuss uh, that in samples and where we came on all this. But So yeah, everybody got to talking, shooting the proverbial uh, breeze while sampling some good booze. Well, I won't gonna say good all around that scotch was still scotch, but... I. <laughs> I will say that the 1940s scotch was pretty awesome because it really cut down on the peatiness of it. I mean, it was definitely a a milder or tamer version than what, if anything, I've had now. Well, it's been a while since I've had any Johnny Walker Blue, but it, it was just more, I guess, even kiltered or softer, so to speak, in the pronounced flavors that came off of it. But inversely, what I did think was interesting was it seemed much more similar to me between the two than almost probably any old dusty bourbon then compared to now. Even stuff from the you know eighties, like a you know a turkey, eagle rare, all those that you can get that are, you know, still the same name and label, but you're not drinking the same sauce. Yeah, that scotch, it doesn't have the old funk that like a bourbon will get. When you when you open it up, it doesn't have that library mustiness to it. It, I mean, it's still a scotch. It was a little more muted, a little more palatable for not an experienced scotch drinker, but it doesn't have that, you know, it's not like you're opening up a library book like you do with bourbon sometimes. No, no, not at all. And like I say, the, the continuity definitely seemed to be there as far as a consistent flavor profile. And I mean, best guess, right? That has to be an absence of corn. Uh, some of the other things that's put in bourbon that are not put in scotch that probably allow it to maintain itself a little bit longer. I mean, I'm I'm not going to... We're going to get roasted in the comments if we jump to <laughs> conclusions on something we don't know about. But I will say it's something that we would like to learn more about, oh, I think. Well, my ignorant guess was just the fact that they reuse barrels and always have. So, you know... We look at that theory on as far as, you know, the quality of wood isn't what it used to be. And that obviously being a major component of what goes into the juice over time. They're reusing the same barrels. They're also, you know, would have been used before even that older one was bought, barreled. So then, you know, you've just got much easier, much more consistent flavors, which over time are probably just going to leach out less, I would guess. True, true. But it, it was overall, though, it was a good night. Although the the clock was ticking down and we were just like, we are not going to have enough time to record before Zeke has to get home to the family. We went our separate ways after that night. I went down and went on a Disney cruise. Uh, Zeke went down to Georgia because that's what the devil does. And, (laughs) And then, you know, I got back into town last night and there was no way we were recording last night. After I was chasing a two and a half year old around a Disney cruise, meeting all the characters, 
I will say uh, just a, a pro tip. We talked about it a little bit in our Facebook group, shameless plug. If you are not in the Dad's Drink of Bourbon Facebook group, everybody's doing it. Uh, it's a place to, to have more conversation with us and talk a little bit more. It is a closed group, so make sure you answer the questions and go ahead and join. But I was talking about the Meridian, which is a bar on the Disney cruise. They do a bourbon tasting for $28, which... You know, if you know cruise alcohol prices, it really isn't that bad. Mm -mm. It was a Johnny Walker Black. It was then a uh, a Macallan. And then it was an Irish whiskey. And I can't remember off the top of my head which Irish whiskey. It was... The, the ship was listing pretty hard that night. And everybody was kind of getting rocked to sleep during the tasting, I think. So is this billed as a bourbon tasting or a whiskey tasting? A whiskey tasting. Okay. And then the last one was Blanton's. So you kind of went through what's the difference between an Irish whiskey, a scotch, or what's a blended scotch versus a, a you know, regular single malt scotch, an Irish whiskey, and a bourbon. Hmm. I could get it on the nose. So before we even sat down, I go, okay, I know which one's in every glass. We're good. I'm going to go to sleep now. Uh, you weren't that guy, were you, John? No, I shut up because I was so tired. <laughs> I just kind of, he's asking for tasting notes and everybody was kind of, I mean, he did a very good job explaining everything. It was, it was very, a very good overview if you haven't sampled different whiskeys, but to get those four whiskeys for $28, I just was happy to sit there and shut up and drink some good stuff. Oh, not too bad. But the Meridian on the 12th floor aft of the ship. I will say, though, they do have Pappy 23 for $300 a pour. So Would they let you pour it yourself? No. Oh, bummer. They have a lot of uh, rare whiskeys, more rare scotch. They have Dalmore. I thought you were going to say a chicken squall. It's going to be impressed. No, no, no. <laughs> But uh, but it was a nice place. You can smoke cigars up there. It was a nice place to kind of get away and escape the the children of the boat, I will say. Most importantly, did you have your phone and or did it work while you were in that uh, other area? No. So oh, I didn't man. do the, winter, I didn't winter, do the chicken dinner package. Yeah. But they do have this thing on the ship where you can actually go on the ship's Wi-Fi and then you can still communicate. You can text with the mm -hmm. people in your party while you're on the ship. You just can't go on the internet. So you, in theory, you could have been summoned away from enjoying that cigar then. Exactly. Oh, bummer. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I do, if, if anyone from Disney or Disney Cruise Line is listening, the dads are available to go on a cruise and do a proper bourbon tasting. We are available. We, we would be happy to go. Bring the family. You guys are going to say they're going to have to comp the whole family. You know how expensive a trip that'd be? Hey, I'm just <laughs> saying we could do multiple tastings on a voyage. You know, like they, they could watch the kids. It's like the biggest uh, role reversal ever. I think our other halves would finally be happy for once because of uh, the bourbon thing yielding something. I know. So Yet Disney... every other dad on that cruise... Their wife would be cussing them like you're going to another tasting. Really, I'm just saying we could go through <laughs> different types. We for could once do. We wouldn't be getting cussed about drinking. I know we could do more than one type of of bourbon. You know, we could talk about the difference between a bourbon and a rye. We could really focus on American whiskey, the American malts that are coming out. We are happy to talk about anything. So shameless plug again, Disney Cruise Line hit us up. We we would love to sail with you. <laughs> but let's get so we were in the midst uh the other night we were trying to talk about heaven hill 27 and then we were talking about our friend heath clark and h clark distillery down in thompson station they are about to release a bottled and bond on december 8th and it's going to be a great day for everyone to come down to h clark i'm sure he's going to have some music playing the cornhole going the grill fired you know heath he always does it right so he released uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was actually, man, it was a few weeks ago now. I got to go down and spend some time with Heath, and him and I just sat around, and we got some of this bottled and bond. We drank it. We talked about it. And then for you, Zeke, we went up and drilled a hole in a gin barrel and tried some of his barrel-aged gin. I brought you some back. We don't have to talk about that. We don't know what he's going to do with it and when, but I will tell you it was damn good. And uh, the flavor profile jumped around to all these different notes that they didn't put in there. 
you know, but water really just changed it. Cause when we got it out, it was something like 150 proof. You put a little bit of water in there and it really just mellowed it out nicely. I know you got some of that and I hope you enjoy it. Cause I drilled the barrel just to get it for you. He even lets you run the drill? Yeah, uh, no. Uh -oh. I watched him. I, I held the light. We were up in the attic of the barn <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, I held the light while he drilled it. Could you even stand up all the way? No. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm envisioning you know a, a, a very tiny attic and you've been over in some awkward looking position trying to hold a light and also get pictures with your phone and then like dropping something. Uh, I was holding a light in one hand and getting a video with the other. Yeah, I, I can see this being a lot going on. <laughs> but we will talk about he's bottled in Bond. And then uh, we'll, we'll talk about this Heaven Hill 27 it is a 27-year-old release from Heaven Hill. We should talk about it before we get into our reviews. If you haven't heard us before, we're pretty simple. We just give whatever we get, right or wrong. Everybody's right when it comes to bourbon. It's just what your palate gets. This was not sent to us from Heaven Hill. We were lucky enough to get some samples of this in a bottle share that we did in Nashville. It was not supplied to us from Heaven Hill. This was our own purchase along with a bunch of other people. It's 27 years old, 94.7 proof, 47.35% ABV. It is 78% corn, 12% malted barley, and 10% rye. The MSRP on this is $400. It was produced at the old Heaven Hill Springs Distillery, which Zeke is your favorite thing because it's pre-fire. It is 41 barrels that were distilled in 1989 and 1990 which yielded 2,820 bottles at the end of the day not too bad not too bad what's that come out to an average per barrel I, now you're making me think you didn't have that stat written down john you're the no. stat guy here this i mean it's got to be what we rely on so 41 into 2820 it's got to be like 50 50 something percent yeah i think yeah. it's around 50 50 to 60s give or take 55 Luckily, I talked about this with some friends earlier, so I was trying to see how quick your math skills were. 53.5. That's a Weller 107. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is when we were talking about this the other day with our friend Brian from Diageo, we were talking about how there was 73% evaporation in these uh, barrels, and a lot of them were, were aged on the first couple of floors. But the evaporation, as we learned, doesn't necessarily mean it's the evaporation of liquid in there. It was the evaporation of alcohol, which brought the proof down. But they still did have a decent yield. So when you hear evaporation of 73%, that doesn't necessarily mean there was the volume of the barrel was only 27% liquid. It just meant that the alcohol had evaporated. Well, no, he was saying something about condensation and when it falls back from the roof of the barrel back in. Yeah. So we don't know necessarily what that made the yield of each barrel, but it didn't mean that it was 27%, right? Like it's more than the 27% left in the barrel. If it says it's 73% evaporated, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you only have 27% volume left. Oh, you never know what the fill level is yeah. either. I mean, who knows back then? Yeah, so you learn something new every day. We're still learning. We don't know everything, as a lot of people like to point out to us. We're having this again tonight because we had it. We had it before and we were all ready to do this, but we, we wanted to refresh our palate. So we are having this again tonight. Um, we had it right before we got on. We put some notes down. For me, the, I, I really enjoyed this. I don't know if I enjoyed it at $400. I understand the, the cost and, and, you know, having a 27 year old whiskey and everything that goes into that. So I understand where the cost is. I just don't know if I'm ready to pay $400 for anything. Call me a cheapskate. But the nose was a lot of vanilla and cigars. It really opened up for me after a few minutes, though. It doesn't change as I let it air, but it just became stronger and more intense that vanilla and cigars. What do you get on the, the nose for this one? Uh, Nose-wise, I put down, it definitely had noticeable characteristics of uh, you know, sweet oak. That's how I've always heard it described as far as the difference in some of the wood and uh, you know, the older bottlings like pre-fire. You know, we talked about old turkey, old eager rare, but 
a sweet oak general term there. And then also at times it still was very fresh, peppery, a little bit of uh, vibrance. I just put down it seemed to be a fun balance of both old and new characteristics that just kind of danced around. At some point I got a smell and I put down elderberry. I was trying to look up because that's not something I normally think about. And I don't know where it came from. Were you watching Monty Python? I never really got into those. Oh. Um, so that, that could be a little off base. Um, I've still got a question mark beside that, and apparently I never researched it as much as I needed to, but that's where I was nose-wise with it. The taste for me, I got oak, tannins, and tobacco. That cigar theme really stayed with it. Uh, on the second sip, maybe I got a slight hint of black cherry or dark fruit, but for me, there was almost like a, it almost tasted like I was drinking a cigar, not in a bad way, but the notes that you get in your mouth when you're when you have a really nice fine cigar, I, I got a lot of that, you know, tobacco, almost like a cigar, cigar tobacco, but a sweet vanilla one. Drinking I, a tobacco, oh, drinking, oh, cigar. Oh, I, I, I it's not in a that. bad way. Oh man, you might have turned my stomach with that one a little bit there, John. No, I mean maybe maybe that's what came up in the finish. Like it just my mouth felt like I was smoking a cigar while I was having it. I mean, I think we may, should try this out. I'll, you know, put a cigar and a thing of water for about a week, and the next time we get together. No, because that would it. It wasn't. It wasn't <laughs> in a bad way. It just like you know how your mouth kind of tastes when when you're smoking a cigar. Yeah. Kind of like that. Like it. It just felt like I had been smoking a cigar. Okay. Not like I was drinking a cigar, but like you know, my mouth it, it lingered. I mean. That definitely lingered on the uh, on the finish, and I, I guess I'll just kind of go in to talk about that too. But like, the mouth tingle was nice in there on the chew, uh, but that oak leather, tobacco, dark fruit, they linger. The bourbon taste for me was gone pretty quickly without much fanfare. It, it really just was gone, and that oak, tobacco, vanilla kind of lingered. That whole just cigarness lingered for me it was a theme throughout the whole time i had it is this because you were going on a themed cruise the next couple of days and you were trying to prepare yourself oh boy <laughs> dear god between that and drinking a cigar john now you're gonna give me a nightmare <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe maybe uh, let's see here palette wise and i'll preface this at least just because simply the week before uh, a good friend was in town happened to be able to try uh, for anyone that follows Willet and or horse racing and whatnot, they put out a 27-year the Go Justify bottle. Also, Heaven Hill, presumably. And I was really surprised by it. I mean, I wasn't blown away or amazed, but I think the perceived notion of a 27-year-old bourbon going into it, nobody's really expecting, you know, to be blown away or life-changing by any means. No, but one of the things I will say is that we did have this side-by-side -side, uh, at one point with Evan Williams 23 and I will say that you know for all those notes it really was enjoyable I would love to light up a cigar and have a pour of this with it you know I think it, it pairs very nicely with that and it kind of has that refined luxury feel like you do when you're sitting out on the back deck smoking a cigar drinking a bourbon but we had it side by side with Evan Williams 23 and it completely ruined Evan Williams 23 for me well, they were just completely different. And I think that just, not to deviate, sorry, I was going to bring this up later after the notes, but I think it just really goes to show people how much variance there can be in, you know, Rick location and or Rick itself. Um, you know, also, you never know if the barrels could have possibly had a different char. Odds are the mash was the same back then. For 23 or 27, I, I didn't see hardly any similarities that I would at least expect in my mind of, all right, so yeah, this one's 23, 27. They're going to be pretty close there, but they really weren't. They're pretty far apart. Exactly. I'm, I'm right there with you. But jumping back on track to the Heaven Hill 27, uh, palette-wise for me, uh, I've got down the, the oak was strong initially, but honestly not as much as you would expect for 27 years in the wood. Eventually the, the you know bitterness from that does seem, seem to overtake uh, the, the marshmallow flavor 
uh, that I you know usually find in a lot of the old good pre-fire bottles and whatnot. It was not too viscous, honestly. At moments, uh, it, it really tried to be a sweet and savory, uh, and I just put down you know as much as it tried. You know, Father Time's going to win this battle every every single time. Um, also, similar notes as far as uh, you know, when you get a little bit of pepper that would kick up and a little vibrancy. It would be in a, you know, a flash here and there, but eventually, you know, the end result was just, wow, this thing's been aged, or these barrels were aged for a long damn time. Finish-wise, I put down, uh, honestly, I thought it was an amazing linger. Uh, I, I said it, the, the finish to me, compared to most things that I've had, uh, literally equated to the extra amount of time that these, you know, were in the barrels as opposed to other stuff that, you know, 8, 9, 10, 12-year-old juice. I mean, the, the finish just, it stayed for forever. And uh, <laughs> laughably, a couple of tidbits I had on that, especially uh, funny with John's theme. My note was that, the, you know, once the finish finally left, it's like the following, following morning after a cigar when you wake up, if you uh, don't brush your teeth or have too much to drink following it, just that lingering taste that's kind of there and that, you know, knack that you just can't get rid of fast enough. Um, the other analogy I had was uh, kind of like if you were, uh, you know, doing s'mores this time of year and, uh, you know, you fix one and forget about it or, you know, you might be drinking or whatnot. The next day when you're cleaning up around the house or outside, you, you find a s'more nobody ate and you went to, ah, why not? I'm hungry. It's early. I'll try to taste this thing. Um <laughs> That, uh, that graham cracker is pretty wet and uh, dewy, most likely, and uh, <laughs> kind of destroys the, the whole flavor concept. Or not destroys, but it definitely alters it pretty strongly. So what's your overall take on this? At, at $400, would you buy this? Would you would you pass on it? Would you get it at a bar? What would you do? I, I think this is a perfect split bottle. I mean, granted, they're obviously going for a very fair amount of coin on secondary, at least last I checked. Uh, but for me, you know, this is going to be a one-time release, at least as far as anyone can tell, especially the fact that it's pre-fire versus not. They can't have too many more of these old barrels just sitting around. So if there is any additional releases, who knows if they'll even be the, you know, the same stuff, so to speak. Um, so, I, yeah, I think it's just a definite, a good split. Uh, you know, on that note, big thanks to uh, JB. For uh, for doing that, he was lucky enough to to find two or three of these at retail, and you know as soon as he got them, just posted, "Hey, got these, popping them." Here was the cost, same to you per ounce. Honestly, I, I can't think of too many other bottles recently that have been just an ideal split like this is. And I can't think of too many other people like JB. Just to take a second uh, to, I mean, this guy put together something like 30 samples of this. Oh, no, it was... <laughs> I, I mean, whatever. It was, it was... He went and filled up ounce bottles of this for so many people. There's not that many people that would go ahead and do that. It's, you know, JB especially, but it's one of the things that makes the Nashville community so special that, you know, we have people that would go get an allocated release like this and say, hey, I got it. I'm popping it. Who wants some? And, uh, you know, also another note that I'd written down, <clears throat> I'm surprised John didn't bring it up because it's usually uh, more, more his cup of tea, but the box and the presentation of this thing, I think if, if you know, a retailer happened to pull it out and said, well, do you want this? Man, it'd be hard to walk away from. If you see <laughs> it, you know, it's one of those things, and, and I said that I would, I would have some trepidation at $400, but if I had the $400, you know, if it wasn't Christmas time and if I didn't just go on a Disney cruise, if they got me in like March, I'm in. Yeah. I think, uh, I think if it's in front of you, you're just like, man. And, then, and that's not, honestly not even as a, the prospect of, or the notion of flipping. It's just, this is really interesting looking. You know, it's never going to come around again. Are you going to enjoy drinking the whole bottle or would you want to? Some maybe, but but I don't think so. But it actually has, so it it's encased in this open wood case. So it's not like a, a Booker's case where closed in on three sides. I mean, you can actually see it from the side. And then there is a magnetic piece of wood 
at the very top that you have to take out in order to get the bottle out. And then it goes back and it, it attaches via a magnet and you hear it click into place. And it's just, it's very impressive. Heaven Hill went above and beyond to make sure that this limited edition release and, and this unique release had unique packaging to go. They had a little it. booklet thing in there too, didn't it? Oh yeah. They definitely did what they should have for a release like this. You have to give them credit for that. You know, I think when you have those releases that get up in that price, you would like to see more than just the bottle on the shelf. You would like to be wooed if you're going <laughs> to, you know, need to be wooed a little bit. Uh, and they definitely hit the packaging and the presentation. It looked classy. Uh, for me, it tasted classy. I, I wish, you know, a lot of times people think we're just being cheapskates. I mean, we're two dads out here that like a very expensive hobby and we have to think about being creative sometimes to get it. It's not like if I had the 400 bucks to spend, I'm in. I'm I'm in all the time. But we have, you know, we have kids to think about. We have wives to think about. And, uh, and, and sometimes just can't float 400 bucks at a certain time of the year. But like we said, it's one of the perfect things to bottle split. Yep. Group text message. Who's in? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. So I think our vote is that it's good, but I don't think I would, I don't think I'd have the cojones to pony it up on my own this time of year. I mean, I wouldn't even put the, the this time of year asterisk on it. I, I just think it's enjoyable and it's fun. And, you know, like I say, it's nothing I think anybody's going to hoard or sit on and, and slowly sip over the next few years. You know, pass it around, share it with folks, and, and you know, enjoy it as it's meant to be. And, uh, you know, the fact there is a little of a premium price on it, uh, you, you know, folks understand. And I don't think anybody would have a problem splitting this with 10 to 20 close friends in a you know heartbeat. No, no, not at all. So moving on, we did try H. Clark Distillery, the bottle and bond. Heath did give this to us he gave us a a sample bottle which we shared i got a little more than zeke because i got to go down to the distillery and try it with heath oh i thought you were talking about these glasses because yours look twice as full as mine (laughs) i don't know i but we there were only 220 bottles of this that are coming out on december 8th which is why uh he is going to do a distillery release it is a little bit special there's only 220 bottles of these this bottle was laid down the same time that his barrel one was laid down that was released two years ago. For those of you that know Heath, we've had him on the show three or four times now. Go back into the archives. We've had some really, really good conversations with him. One about kind of how he got started and how he changed the legislation in Tennessee. We had one where we talked about his rye. We had one where we were talking about um, the the barrel pick that Craft Brood did of his, that that is actually going to come out here uh, soon. They did two barrels and they released each barrel separately, but now they're going to mi- mingle them together and have a third release or a third bottle. That's oh yeah, I forgot come. they did that. They only released half of each barrel and then took, put them back in. So that is about to drop. Huh, So. Look out for that at Craft Brood. That's going to be pretty good. I think it's going to be just shy of 130 proof, but it will be a mingling and, and a marriage of the, the two barrels they did that tasted really good together. Did you get to drill that one? No. Oh, John. I wish. I wish. John, but. John, John. As we know, this one is a bottled and bond, has all the bottled and bond characteristics that we talk about ad nauseum, but it is 100 proof, 50% ABV, aged about 49 months, so a month over the requirement of 48 months to be bottled and bond, as well as a bunch of other requirements that need to be. Anybody else in Tennessee doing bottled and bond? Jack Daniels has one. Do they? I don't, I don't think Dickel does. I don't. Pritch. Bell Mead, I think theirs might eventually. I don't know. Hmm. Because theirs is still land, so it's going to be over four years. Yeah. But I don't know if it they met all the other requirements for bottle and bond. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But nose on this one, I mean, 
So I always like Heath's stuff. It is a four grain whiskey. It is a little bit different. It has some malt to it. it it's kind of, it is a four grain whiskey, but he, it, it's almost like he's a, a beer brewer first and, and there's always that malt characteristic to it. I know he kind of always aims for a, a mixture of a Weller and Four Roses profile, but um, I think it gets a little more malt than that. And, and I don't always get that on his stuff, but I really like his stuff because it's like an oatmeal malt. You can tell that he has a lot of those beer characteristics to it. The nose on this one for me, I'm just going to run through all of them. Nose on this one was like malted sweet candy, vanilla sweet fruit. It was very, very sweet on the nose for me. I thought it was a, a really, really well done nose to have to to really approach the whiskey. And, and I'm not just saying that because we were friends with him and he gave us this sample. But um, I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. The nose really kind of drew me in. The taste was like grandma's cooking in the oven. It was like that oatmeal malt baking like she's making cookies for me is what I got. Um, like a sweet malted cookie with baking spices. And and that obviously I, I said it over and over and I like to say words over and over just to annoy Zeke. But Oh, I, I wish I'd, you know, took a shot every time you said malt. I'd be in great shape right now. I know. Malt. If you're playing at home. I'm just malt. glad there's no apricot in this too, or I'd have to shoot myself in the head. No, but it was, it was like a, a baked oatmeal cookie. Like so that's some, interesting because, well, I'll, I'll just go in the notes formally. And then, we'll, and then, and then the finish for me, it was a dark fruit that lingered and, and it kind of just stayed there nicely in the palate. Um, not too much of a burn for me on this at a hundred proof. Um, but it was just a really enjoyable pour. I, I re, it's, the thing I was going to say, and then I will let you give your notes, is it's everything I wish Stranahan's was. The the yellow label Stranahan's. Like the, it, it really is. I know you're a big Stranahan's fan, but if we're talking about a, an American whiskey that has malt in it, I this I loved 10 times more than Stranahan's. Hmm. Interesting. I guess I would at least... Uh initially just so i don't forget to think about it would be i wonder on the perception of malt because although i get it in there um, it was not the heaviest characteristic i really got at all whereas with stranahan's it is number one it's more of the oatmeal yeah to me is, um, is i mean i said malt over over and over just to annoy you but it's really that oatmeal mixed with the malt but it's more of a, a heavier oatmeal than the malt Hey, you're, you're not annoying me. I at least have a drink in my hand. I'm going to feel bad. People that hear this and they're in their car going to work and then their kids in the back seat going, Malt, Dad, Malt, 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 my, Malt, my. Malt, Malt. Man, I don't have a wreck. <laughs> I, I, for, I just, if someone's having a drinking party with us, just drink every time. Re listen to this episode. Or <laughs> <laughs> equally a uh, pin hook and apricot. Hey. <laughs> All right, so on the bottled and bond here from Heath, nose-wise, um, I picked up some chocolate, barley, malts. Um, there was light singe I got. Um, you know, it says appropriate for a 100 proofer. The the big thing I picked up uh, was the bakeless cookies. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know, things like chocolate, oatmeal, and probably a few other things, but, you know, they just mix it up all well and then throw it down on a wax piece of paper uh, you know, it looks kind of like a sand dollar or some other shape, but you don't actually bake them. That was the biggest profile I got out of it. I mean, it really just seemed to dial it up 100% for me. I just got excited because it was like a cookie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I put down that it was, you know, more stout tasting to me, or like an oatmeal stout, than a bourbon, which, not to go too far off the tracks here, but, you know, if you follow stuff locally, Bell Mead just put out their second edition barrels of the Black Bell, which I admittedly, you know, haven't been a fan of, of either release of either of the barrels really. But to me, whatever the the stout difference in those versus what I'm picking up on this with that extra added oatmeal, it goes from non enjoyable to enjoyable for whatever reason. I mean, I like plenty of stouts, Guinness and you know, even oatmeal stouts, but 
to me, something about that one more just staunch, darker profile when mixed in with a, a, a bourbon just didn't hit home for me. But this does pretty darn well, I think. Uh, after some time in the glass, it did finally pick up a little bit of corn on the back end of the nose. But, it, you know, it's by no means overly off-putting. And, and for only four years, I think people are going to go in expecting to get much more corn, honestly. Palette-wise, it was just an, an oat bomb. Uh, that's what I kept thinking about was, you know, laughing about how much the Black Bell is, you know, somewhat of a blend, so to speak, profile-wise wise of, uh, you know, beer and, and bourbon that has always been off-putting to me. And this one, I you know, I got the same initial conception of, wow, this is really just kind of like an oatmeal stout, but it's bourbony, you know, not heavier in the beer sense, but obviously alcohol-wise. And, and that was really the biggest note that I had. Um, again, uh, similar to the nose after some time in the glass, uh, some sweetness to kind of pick up on the back end. Didn't get a ton of finish, but um, I mean, honestly, that's usually not my biggest note or concern or, or what I pick up. But, um, you know, at four years, I, I thought this had a very interesting profile. And as many, um, you know, craft beard people as there are out there now, I think this could really hit an interesting audience of folks that maybe aren't the biggest bourbon fans. But, you know, if you like that style of, uh, you know, oatmeal stout, I think this would definitely be in the wheelhouse. I think that's where get your recorder ready. And I know I say that facetiously because we are being recorded, but Zeke's notes were better than mine on that one. (laughs) And I think you said what I was thinking and I was overwhelmed just by really just enjoying it. I think (laughs) I go for, I liked the Black Bell. I enjoy that whiskey, not all the time. Right, it's not a, it's it's not like I'm going to pull out the black bell every day, um, but I really enjoy that oatmeal stout characteristic um, in a whiskey. I don't mind it, and and I really enjoyed this one. I think probably because it's that oatmeal stout, but almost had that cookiness to it. Uh, and you're right. I, I think a lot of the things that I think I'm that I was calling malt. I think is more of that oatmeal stout characteristic. And, mm. and just in listening to you, it almost refined what I was thinking in my head. Uh, not like you were swaying me to an opinion, but just really clarified what I was getting. Cause sometimes I think we all just kind of get a rush of flavor in our mouth and you're like, what is that? <laughs> and then somebody says it, you're like, yes, yes, that was it. But I will definitely be in line to get one of these, uh, not only to support a local distiller who helped really make craft distilling a big thing in Tennessee uh, and is, you know, one of the big guys responsible for the Tennessee Whiskey Trail and all the things going on with that. But I also really, really enjoy this whiskey. Uh, Zeke, I think, I I don't want to speak for you, but I think you're in the camp and you'll probably just take pours from me. Maybe only the fact uh, I'd also th- throw the asterisks in of it being distillery only, and I'm not sure if I can make it down there for that. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I did enjoy this, and, and honestly, it being you know Christmas time of year, and uh, those bakeless cookies just all always show up, you know, somewhere at somebody's house or somebody brings them to work. <laughs> I think if you just you know sat down one night with a, a nice pour of this. Uh, those, those bakeless, you know, flat-looking oatmeal cookies with the uh, light milk chocolate. Man, I don't know if it would beat cookies and milk because it would be so much of a similar flavor versus a little bit of balance. But you, you'd have yourself a good night and then probably sleep well, depending on how big that pour was. I'm planning on uh, killing this bottle over Christmas break. That's kind of, you know, make some cookies with my daughter, uh, hang around with the family, and kill a bottle of this i'll be waiting on the picture from the uh the better half of you know you passed out in the chair you know the the, the, the cookie on the chest and my melt in the, the glasses in the hand and just a big shit eating grin santa fell asleep everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well last but not least i know that i'm, I'm going to throw a curveball here at zeke uh something we were going to talk about last week that we did not get to talk about and we admittedly, we have our notes down on this because we talked about it. 
and Zeke didn't necessarily need notes on this. Uh, but we were planning on having a little conversation, too, in the episode last week on old Ezra barrel strength. The seven years old, likely from Heaven Hill, but it is put out by Luxco. It's 117 proof, 58.5 ABV, retails at $39.99. A lot has come of this in just people talking about this becoming an everyday drinker, this being a really good barrel strength that's out at $40. You know, for me, um, I've seen the price of this go up astronomically on secondary. I've seen stores put this out for $75 bucks now instead of uh, the $40 where it was. And it's becoming increasingly hard to find as buzz comes out about this product. I know some people have done some taste tests on this and it scored pretty high. I got a lot of brown sugar and vanilla on the nose. The taste for me was heavy butterscotch vanilla with a slight hint of oak. The oak is more prevalent the longer it sits out. I also got a little bit of nutty characteristics on it on the on the taste for me. The finish was medium with a nice nut, nutty linger. But my tasting notes aren't really why we're talking about this. I think you could probably do your tasting notes on um, on memory, but <laughs> I'm not going to make you. But uh, do you have some or no? I don't, honestly. When we tasted this, there was a lot going on, and I was in, engaged in about two conversations and trying to balance those. Um, but admittedly, I, I had had a bottle uh, already, and I think it lasted about three days. I'm not saying that in the context of I couldn't stop drinking it. I'm saying that when I got it, you know, it was right after it was released. And yeah, it was a, a, a decent to poor, fine poor, whatever you want to call it. I wouldn't call it, definitely call it anything more than fine. But at the same time, you know, the perception I had was, ah, you know, it's not bad. I'm sure I can get plenty more of these. I'm just going to go and crush one, which, you know, you, you gave me a little bit of a hard time for if we could have used it, which <laughs> probably so. Uh, I guess it was just the mood I was in. Um, Zeke posted it in the Facebook group. And had it open, it was giving notes on it. I said, you know, we could have done that together. Yeah, and then I posted it upside down and empty. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> some days, some nights, some somethings. But um, I don't think that's necessarily why you wanted me to bring it up. No, um, I mean, to me, it's, I guess it's somewhat of a rare occurrence in this day and age, which is pretty sad, but you get what you pay for with it. I mean, coming in, you know it's seven years, you pretty well know it's going to be heaven hill juice and it's cash strength and you know i don't can't think off the top of my head any other cash strength heaven hill stuff that's out there but we've all drank plenty of 100 proof bottle and bonds at six years the virgin seven year 101s out there it's not too far off from other offerings that are in you know you're going to get elijah craig cast strength you're going to get you know the the whh but i mean yeah to me it I laugh and plenty of people message me and and ask about it. And I just continually use the the adage of a a little gif of um, Denny Green back when he was coaching the the Arizona Cardinals. (laughs) They are who we thought they were. And we let them off the hook. But that's what it is. Like you get what you pay for. 40 bucks, seven year, heaven hill juice at cash strength. I I don't think anyone's going to be blown away or amazed. And if they are, it's because of what state the market can be in, especially depending on where you live. Uh, But but I doubt anyone's disappointed either, um, which is sadly just a rarity these days. But I think it's just our way. And and one of the things that we want to touch on, I mean, my notes are not, I I enjoyed it. Brown sugar and vanilla on the nose. I like the, the heavy, heavy butterscotch. It almost coated my mouth with it. Um, that vanilla with the slight hint of oak, I mean, it wasn't a bad bourbon at all. And it is a great bourbon at $40. I would caution anybody that over $40, I I personally, I would put it up in a blind and I would tell you that once you get up into the Four Roses and the Russell's Reserve and the Knob Creek Pick territory and all those you know, once you get into those store pick territories, I am not going to prefer that over a really good store pick from one of 
those three places. I I just I know I've done it blind, and I I would not go for that over Four Roses, Russell's Reserve, Knob Creek, all those other things that you can get that are really really solid. You know the it just doesn't wow me enough. It at forty dollars, I say it's a great bourbon for the price. Yeah, especially if you're a a, a cash strength fan. Um, but at the same time, there's plenty of people that aren't. And to those people, Long Branch at forty bucks is where they'd rather be, and that's fine too. But Old Ezra has. Uh, I, I will do a plug for Grand Cru in town has Old Ezra at a hundred and one proof for seven years. That's a twenty dollar bottle, and. You know, if this is going up to uh, if this is going up to seventy five, that twenty dollar bottle looks really, really good. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to drop seventy five bucks, go find the discontinued Ezra twelve. That's a good pour. Yep, that's a great pour. But we just want to make sure we got that in there. We want to make sure we covered it because it was lingering on our mind as a lot of people asked us what we thought of the Ezra. But if you want to hear more of what we think, go ahead and join our Facebook group. I know I've already mentioned that. It's Dad's Drinking Bourbon on Facebook. Zeke will talk to you on there, right? Yeah. I mean, we both try to keep up with it. Uh, Obviously, life, work, kids, and whatever beckon from time to time. And uh, I don't know. There was that glitch, you know, last week, which everything was all a Facebook. But, you know, groups just weren't uh, getting updates. Well, the chronological thing just wasn't working. Like, Oh, yeah. I would continuously see somebody post it and click on it like, can't find any posts. <laughs> they delete it. Somebody lying to me. But we we do try to get in there a lot. But there are a lot of good people in that group that are posting and talking, and uh, it's a great community. We think everybody should join it. Go ahead and find our podcast on your favorite podcast provider: Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, Podknife, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Podbean, whatever you like. Go ahead and find us. Uh, we're also on TuneIn. We're on uh, YouTube, audio only. Please leave us a five-star review. Tell us why you like us. Those things actually do help. It, it bumps us up so that more people can find us. So please just take two seconds out of your day. Leave us a five-star review. Um, we know there's one guy that hates us. So we, whoa, 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 he just talks about you more than me. Wow. Well, we appreciate him listening. I really appreciate that he <laughs> listens. But go ahead and leave us a review. Uh, also, please follow us on Instagram at Dad's Drinking Bourbon, Facebook at Dad's Drinking Bourbon, Twitter at Bourbon Dads. Zeke, where else can the folks find us? You know, most of the time right here in Nashville, Tennessee. Occasionally, John's off drifting on a boat somewhere and other things. But for the most part, we're here. Give us a heads up if you're coming to town. Um, we, we really do love meeting folks and do our best to accommodate where we can. Uh, obviously, we can be somewhat limited depending on what family beckons, uh, but there's nothing more enjoyable to us than uh, you know putting faces and names together and, and sharing some pours, too. Wish I was still floating out there. Cheers. Ciao.